Thank you. That concludes the debate on reversal of the UK Government's two-child benefit cap. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 10709 in the name of Gillian Martin on legislative consent motion Energy Bill UK legislation. I would be grateful if any members who wish to speak in the debate were to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Gillian Martin to speak to and move the motion up to seven minutes, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. As our energy consenting powers are largely executively devolved rather than legislatively, uh, so reserved rather than legislatively devolved, any changes to those schemes requires the agreement of the UK Government and legislation at Westminster. The UK Energy Bill has presented an opportunity to refresh the legislative framework under which we operate. We have engaged with the UK Government on this bill in good faith over many months in order to meet our joint objectives of reaching net zero and enhancing domestic energy security, whilst ensuring that the devolution settlement and indeed the powers of this Parliament are respected. The Scottish Government has secured amendments to this bill, which are good for Scotland, provide a degree of protection for devolution and support a just energy transition. The bill will support our efforts to decarbonise heat in buildings by providing new powers for Scottish ministers to make and amend regulations covering energy performance certificates, replacing powers which were lost across the UK EU exit. It enables us to introduce regulation of heat networks that will be critical to meet our statutory heat networks targets, and that will spread the cost of heat networks regulation fairly by pulling cross across Great Britain. And it will give Scottish ministers formal influence over a significant new UK-wide market mechanism to encourage the supply of low-carbon heat appliances by manufacturers. The Scottish Government has also negotiated amendments to mitigate potential negative effects of the bill. The offshore wind provisions have been amended to greatly limit the scope for our Marine Recovery Fund to be used to undermine Scottish ministers' current functions in relation to compensatory measures and, more generally, to reduce the negative impacts of these clauses on devolved functions. Enhanced consultation requirements have been secured to require the UK Government to more fully engage with the Scottish Government on the Energy Savings Opportunity Scheme. And whilst not perfect, this is an improvement on the UK Government's original intentions. The Bill has also been amended to include detailed consultation requirements for a number of clauses relating to carbon capture, utilisation and storage and hydrogen. And the UK Government has committed to the setting up of a ministerial working group on CCUS, which will enable us to drive forward work that is vital to delivering our net zero ambitions. But the UK Government has rejected amendments that would have improved the Bill in relation to issues such as CCUS and hydrogen. Whilst these changes are welcome, I must emphasise that the changes to the Bill do not go nearly far enough. It is the clearly established position of the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament that where provisions in the Bill touched on devolved competence, legislation should include a requirement for the consent of Scottish Ministers. The UK Government has refused to include these consent mechanisms for all but very, a very small number of clauses. And that is not how devolution is supposed to work. The UK Government should respect the views of this Parliament and promote amendments to reflect this. To make matters worse, the UK Government has made clear that unless we agreed to recommend legislative consent is given to the Bill as a whole, including those areas in which we believe they are riding roughshod over devolution, they would revert to the Bill as originally envisaged. And the Scottish Government has made clear that such a negotiation ta tactic is unacceptable. It is tantamount to blackmail and is in incompatible with good faith negotiation on important topics. Now, the SEAL Convention is supposed to require that the UK Government amend legislation to reflect the legitimate expectation that the UK Government will not legislate in devolved areas without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. The UK Government has now turn, chosen to turn the Convention on its head with this take-it-or-leave-it approach. Instead of the need for legislative consent protecting the interests of this Parliament, the threat of proceeding without consent has become a weapon for the UK Government. And this is yet another way in which the UK Government is failing to respect the Sewell Convention, which is now breached on 11 separate occasions. The Scottish Government remains committed to the Sewell Convention and continues to work 
within both its letter and spirit, despite the UK government's, the current UK government's, repeated disregard for its requirements. And we have written to the UK government detailing our objections to this approach. Presiding officer, securing amendments to this bill is vital to the delivery of our net zero ambitions at this crucial juncture, and our decision to recommend consent is made on this basis. And whilst I am recommending that consent is given, I do so reluctantly, and I must, it, it must be made clear. We are being asked to accept a diminution of this Parliament's power under the threat of having those powers further weakened if we do not jeopardising investment in our renewable sector and undermining our efforts to meet net zero. That is not a partnership of equals. These are the actions of a bully, cheating the Scottish Parliament and by extension the Scottish people with nothing but contempt. Now, our recommendation of consent on this occasion should in no way be taken as an acceptance of the UK Government's approach to negotiations on this bill. The Scottish Government is determined to deliver a just energy transition which enables the people of Scotland to realise the benefit of our rich renewables endowment and, and achieve a net zero future. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you. And I now call on Douglas Lomsden up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And we are happy to support this legislative consent motion, if not the tone in which the Minister has presented it to the Chamber this afternoon. It's actually heartening, President Officer, to see a good level of cooperation between the Scottish Government and the Westminster Government that is so much needed but seldom found. This is an issue that the whole of the UK should be working together on as it affects us all. Ensuring our energy supply and sustainability is key to us achieving our net zero targets and exploding and legislating for new technologies is vital to our energy security. We also like to thank the Net Zero Committee and the Delegated Power and Law Reform Committee for the time that they have taken to consider this matter and their careful scrutiny of this lengthy and complicated bill. And I was happy, to, happy that the, this work was done by the Net Zero Committee um, before I joined, because I can see how much uh, work uh, was involved. With over 300 clauses, there was a lot to get through, and clearly there are many areas that require a UK-wide response that also includes powers delegated to the Scottish Government. I welcome the consultation and obviously detailed conversations that have happened between civil servants and ministers across both governments. And I must say, President Officer, how refreshing to see both our governments working together on this. Many of the concerns that were raised by the Net Zero Committee and the report of the 17th of March have now been addressed, which is reflected in the report published on the 26th of September. I'm also grateful to my fellow committee members and clerks for bringing me up to speed so quickly on what is a complicated and detailed bill. Throughout the clauses before us today is reference to the ministerial forum that will address many of the issues of contention within the bill. I would ask the minister for clarity on the frequency of the meeting for this forum, if she has it, the process for agreeing the agenda and how the minister proposes to update this chamber on those discussions moving forward. It may also be helpful to the Minister if the relevant party spokespeople could also meet with her before and after these meetings to discuss progress. It is import important for this process to be as transparent as possible, given the implications for business and communities throughout Scotland and in the North East in particular. I would also be, it would also be helpful if the Minister could share the details of the Memorandum of Understanding that is to be established between the Scottish and UK governments and how they will work together on the policy relating to the economic regulation of CO2 transport and storage. This is going to be a new market and any information would be appreciated. These are points that are picked up in the recommendation from the Delegate Powers and Law Reform Committee in their recommendations. The Scottish Parliament must be given the means by which to scrutinise and hold ministers to account for their position in any agreement with the United uh, UK Government. Perhaps the Minister would like to update us now or in her closing remarks. A key area of this bill is around the relatively new industry of carbon capture, which is really exciting for our own ACORN project. I say new, but I think certain parts of the world have been doing it for a while now. Scotland is uniquely placed with its deep underground depleted oil and gas wells to store huge amounts of carbon deep underground and hopefully this is an industry that can have a huge economic benefit for the whole of Scotland. President officer, it's vital that we all, we all see the benefits of the move away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy. 
Businesses and communities in the North East are eager to do their part, a topic that I spoke about just last week. And these measures will assist with that. Clear and consistent policy from both governments on carbon capture, hydrogen, the reduction of emissions from industry and transport, and the provision of low carbon power. I also welcome the bill focus on offshore wind environmental improvement package, as well as the habitats assessment process for offshore wind projects. The bill, as amended, now also imposes an express mandate on Ofgem to support the achievement of net zero, which is key to ensuring that everyone at all levels of government and associated bodies are focused on that goal. District heating systems are also covered in the bill. I'm convinced that district heating networks will have a huge role to play as we move away from traditional gas boilers, especially in much of our urban areas where older traditional flats may not be suitable for air source heat pumps. Presiding officer, without trying to be too negative, one area that still disappoints me is this devolved government stance against new nuclear. Mm -hmm. Wind power is great, but we need to understand that on cold, still days, the wind is not blowing and our turbines are not turning. We need to have a good, reliable base load and not rely on important electricity for our base. We have some great skills in nuclear and we have some great sites connected to the grid. And I would urge the Scottish Government to keep an open mind. Technology is changing and decommissioning is changing. It can provide a real economic benefit to Scotland. But that said, I support the LCM motion for us today. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. And I now call on Sarah Boyack. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, at decision time, Labour will support this LCM. The energy bill currently progressing through the UK Parliament is the first piece of energy legislation at this scale to be considered since 2015. So it's a huge opportunity to try and get all the key ambitions in terms of the just transition and the shift to net zero. But as commentators have described it as a mammoth bill, it still does not go far enough and there is much more that needs to be done. And on one level, you've just heard the, sorry, we've just heard the discussion between the Scottish National Party and the Conservative Party about where they disagree. The one thing I will take away from this debate is that there have actually been some successes in terms of the Scottish Government getting some negotiation success in terms of amendments to this bill. So that is important. Um, and uh, the other comment I would make is it's not just important to see the UK and Scottish governments working together, but our local authorities are absolutely key players in delivering the planning and community heat and energy projects that we urgently need in our communities. And it's important that we do not forget that. So while this energy bill does make some progress, it will leave the UK falling behind in the global race for the jobs and industries of the future. The bill's stated aims are to leverage private investment in clean technologies such as carbon capture and storage and hydrogen, reform the energy system so it's fit for the future, such as facilitating the deployment of energy storage and appointing Ofgem as a regulator for heat networks, and ensuring the safety, security and resilience of the UK's energy system. But there is so much more that could have been done. And while there are a lot of technical considerations included in the bill, a lot of them are actually quite piecemeal and timid, falling short of the action required. I was very pleased to see that during the passage of the bill, some of the amendments made by my Labour colleagues in both the Commons and the Lords were agreed to. And the two I, w I want to highlight in particular, moving the hydrogen levy away from consumers' bills um, will mean that, that investment to increase hydrogen is still put in place, but not on the backs of consumers who would be forking out huge amounts of money for high energy bills. But I do want to emphasise that it's important that we keep the focus on the push for green hydrogen and that we actually support developments across Scotland where there's um, huge technological process and major opportunities to use our renewables, particularly offshore renewables. In addition, establishing a net zero duty for Ofgem ensures that net zero is at the heart of the regulator's work. And that is absolutely critical because there are a number of changes that need to be made, but net zero needs to hold that together. So while this bill is a step forward, I do believe there is so much more that needs to be done to deliver the just transition we urgently need. There were also amendments that Labour supported in the House of Lords, which were then removed from the final stage of the bill. For example, on banning coal mines, absolutely key to net zero. 
and the bill fails to support energy efficiency standards for the private sector housing in England. And that would have saved tenants in England hundreds of pounds. And that's a huge disappointment as we discuss this during Poverty Week. One of the progressive policies was cancelled in Rishi Sunak's net zero speech. So let's not kid ourselves, this legislation is not perfect. When we vote for this motion tonight, my, our view is that this bill was a missed opportunity, something commented on by Renewables UK and other industry groups. And I would say that if a Labour government was elected in the near future, we would continue that cooperative um, work together between the UK and Scottish Government, but we would be much more bold because we need a sprint to clean energy by 2030. We'd establish GB Energy, a publicly owned energy generation company, HQ'd in Scotland. We'd invest in the skills that we need now to develop the jobs, supply chains and infrastructure to transition our energy supply. And that is something that comes across from all the renewables industries I've been meeting, all the companies that are involved in oil and gas that want to transition across. It's critical and we need that political support now. And the Scottish Government needs to step up to the mark. And I'd also say that the development of community-owned energy projects is crucial, and we're missing a huge opportunity here right across the UK, but in Scotland. And that goes back to having the resources at the local level to get going on these projects. And finally, we would establish a national wealth fund to help secure the private investment, to ensure there's finance now and in the future, to support the aspirations of some of these provisions in the bill and the aspirations many of us have for a decarbonised, clean power energy network here in Scotland that would be affordable, not just to households, but to business as well. That's not going to come from this bill. We need change, but we'll support it because of the small steps forward it will make. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I now call on the Minister to wind up. Up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I would like to address some of the, the, the points made by uh, Douglas Lumsden, questions from Douglas Lumsden and points made by Sarah Boyack. First of all, if I go to Douglas Lumsden, he asked about mem memorandum of understanding that is still to be negotiated and agreed on and indeed established. Um, he asked about the, the ministerial, I called it the working group, but it's ministerial for, forum on CCUS. Um, my officials have actually had some initial meetings around this, but again, it's not been, been formalised as yet. Um, I want to point to um, one of the remarks he made about the provisions about hydrogen production and transport. Um, clause 154, that was one of the areas that we wanted to have consent of Scottish ministers and this was not agreed. It's very unfortunate because uh, at the moment it's just about consult, consulting Scottish ministers. So we really are going to have to, to, to beef up that, that forum so that it effectively is uh, consent, but by a, a, another, another name in, in that regard. Because we have really worked together on this bill. There has been a lot of negotiations between the UK government ministers and Scottish government ministers uh, on this. And I hope that that's the spirit in which we will uh, will continue. I want to point to, um, Sarah Boyack has mentioned some of the amendments that her party put in place and we, brought, we welcome most of those amendments as well and it was, uh, it was actually nice to, to hear Sarah Boyack uh, recognise some of the work that's been done by the Scottish Government to get some amendments over the line that are going to be good for, for Scotland and the people of Scotland. I have to say also very much, and, and I hope this is where she was going with the, 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 the comment on hydrogen, we need more agreement on hydrogen standards and, and labelling because it, particularly when we're talking about exporting of hydrogen, the people who want to buy hydrogen be, uh, produced in Scotland want green hydrogen so we need to get those standards agreed so I'm glad to hear that Labour support is uh, on that. But presiding officer, I will wind up, I just want to say that uh, you know, notwithstanding the issues around the negotiation ta tactics and, and I do understand why the Welsh Government haven't given consent because of those, of those as well notwithstanding that and obviously that's a wider issue um, I want to say that this, uh, much in this bill is long overdue. The stated aim of this bill was to increase resilience and reliability of energy systems across the UK, support the delivery of the UK's climate change commi uh, commitments and reform the UK's energy system whilst minimising costs to consumers and protecting them from unfair pri pricing. I agree with Sarah Boyack, it could have gone further, maybe we'll see th certain things go further in the future, but I hope that everyone will agree that despite those, uh, those uh, no great 
negotiations and some of the tactics around that and some of its limitations. This bill is in Scotland's best interest and I hope that everyone will vote to consent to the motion today. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on legislative consent motion, Energy Bill UK legislation. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 10729 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak on the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 10729 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motions 10730 on a stage one timetable and 10731 on a stage one extension. And I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motions to press their request to speak button. And I call on George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motions. And once again, moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motions. Therefore, the question is that motions 10730 and 10731 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motions are therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of two Parliamentary Bureau motions. And I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions 10732 on committee meeting times and 10733 on designation of a lead committee. Thank you, President Officer, and both moved. Thank you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time. And I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward now. And I invite the Minister to move the motion. No problem. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? We are agreed, and there are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that Amendment 10716.2 in the name of Miles Briggs, which seeks to amend Motion 10716 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville, on reversal of the UK Government's two-child benefit cap, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote, and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access digital voting.